Hello there, my name is Evan Wood. I am your guest host today and welcome to Gotta Run With Will. Uh, I am really, really honored and excited to introduce my guest today. You may know him as a youth minister from Bethel, Connecticut. You may know him as the unlikely hero of the ill-fated 2012 New York City Marathon. You may know him as the founder of Run Anyway. His name is Lance Venson, and he is here with us today. Hello, Lance. Welcome. Hello, Rail. Great introduction. Thank you so much. <laughs> I am so, so excited. I feel like this is a very personal, special occasion for me uh, hosting you here. And I know that you, you've been here before, uh, and but it's been some time since you've been here on Gotta Run. Yeah. Um, but you know, in a way, my running journey started with the Run Anyway 2012 New York City Marathon. So first of all, thank you so much for, for creating that experience for me and for you and so many thousands of runners during a really difficult time in our city's history and in marathoning history. Oh, well, thank you so much. Yeah, it really was an unprecedented time. And it's kind of like, in a, in a way, like an unprecedented time that we're going through right now. Like even this interview, right, had to be delayed because of everything that's going on in the country yep. and in our city uh, with uh, the pandemic. So it's good to be here back on uh, Gotta Run With Will. It's nice. And what we went through in 2012, obviously, was like something that has never happened before. So nobody knew how to react to it. So just like now, we didn't know how to react to it. But it's so cool. Even years later, like now, it's it, we're coming up on nine years this is going to be the ninth year of the, the anniversary of the Run, Any Mar Run Anyway Marathon starting. Um, and it's still great. We get to meet people that it still affected then. Like you and I only met a couple months ago. And uh, getting to hear your story um, along with so many others is always so encouraging. So it's nice that even, you know, almost a decade later, you know, positive things are still happening. Absolutely. It's uh, such a full circle thing that's happening right, right here because, you know, even though, you know, we were we were both part of that day. And obviously you orchestrated it. I was there. That was my first marathon distance run ever in my life. That's right. And uh, that was such a, you know, I was, uh, you know, 18 years old. <laughs> I had just started running. I was overcoming my own difficult challenges in life. And uh, to have that reason to run anyway, mm. um, that whole idea of running for something beyond yourself. Yeah. I was running for a charity team that year and I had fundraised. And so uh, there are just such amazing parallels, I feel, between our stories. Obviously, you've gone on and done so many, uh, gone on so many amazing, crazy journeys uh, that that have touched so many people. Mm. Um, well, you. you know, I've I've just run New York City every year, but it's kind of cool that we've also run New York City Marathon, the official marathon, every year That's since right. uh, since 2013 together, and we'll both be running it this year in 2021. Yeah. No, that's um, exciting, yeah, because yeah. it means that we've we've done it all like together. Right. That would run anyway. Marathon was my first official. We'll say marathon distance. I counted as my first official marathon, um, but yeah, that that was the the first one. So now we've done eight New York cities. I wonder how many years see, we can keep it see, going. Yeah, exactly. Well, my my personal life goal, secret not secret goal anymore, because I'm on TV now. Sure. Is uh, I you know I started when I was 18, and if we count the run anyway New York City marathon, I have a chance of having the longest streak of New York City marathons ever. But, but, you know, we're on the same streak. So I hope that both of us uh, get to continue running as many New York City marathons and marathons and ultra marathons in general yeah. for, the, for as long as we yeah, want. You, I love how you said uh, the Run Anyway Marathon, you actually were doing it for charity, right? Yeah. Yeah, and so that's obviously my story too, where I was running for a charity, which is what prompted me to run anyway. Because I have this mentality of like, want to want to finish, want to complete what I started no matter what. But all of a sudden, I was like running for something bigger than myself. So I, I, I wonder, like, if the marathon got canceled and I was just running to run, like, would I have had the same attitude? And I don't honestly think I would have. The fact that I was running for a charity and running for the memory of my uncle who passed away from, from brain cancer. So I was thinking, there's no way that I'm not going to do this. But now how do I do it? Potentially like on a bigger stage. I remember talking to my, my roommate at the time thinking, well, how do we now, now that I know that I'm doing it, how do we do it in a way where it's still going to affect more people? You know, even from the little things of like what we wore that day, you know, you probably did the same thing. Just like a regular marathon, I wore a, an, an old sweatshirt that I wasn't going to wear anymore. And I threw it on the ground that day. Like our team came and picked those up. 
and then we gave them off to the the hurricane victims um, in Staten Island, which was a whole nother like amazing cool event. But yeah, a lot of people don't realize the Run Anyway Marathon effort wasn't just putting together this amazing event uh, spontaneously in Central Park, but you guys also afterward you were a part of the relief effort uh, in Staten Island and New Jersey. You guys really did the work of helping people who were affected by Hurricane Sandy. It wasn't just like oh let's just right. get everyone to come to Central Park and we'll just party and uh, <laughs> we'll run and we'll feel good about ourselves. Yeah. And uh, that's the end of the story. And, you know, too bad for the, the folks who are affected by the hurricane. Um, yeah. yeah. No, we, so like you said, we went to Staten Island afterwards um, and a, a couple of other places. But Staten Island is really where we gave out the stuff from the Run Anyway Marathon Day, which was really exciting. Um, and after that, people started donating to us in addition to. So we got like you know, hundreds of donations of sneakers. And they were like really good quality sneakers. And we went and we were actually able to hand them out. Man, that was that was really special because it was like, okay, it wasn't just that one day. What else could we like continually do, um, which was really cool. They also, um, uh, people handed us money that day and handed us checks. And we didn't know you're not allowed to do that in Central Park. Like people can't just like hand, you can't Solicit just collect. For, yeah. yeah. So people kept doing it and eventually the cops were like, you, you can't do that. So we're like, okay, well, donate online. So people started donating online. But it was great. The, when we tally, tallied up everything, you know, that night and the next day, it was over $16,000. That was on top of everything we'd already done. You know, and uh, we gave it through, we donated all through Hurricane Sandy Relief through a, a church in New Jersey. Um, but that was really cool to be able to, like, um, just continually trying to, trying to do something. Um, because you know what, you know, this doesn't get talked about a lot, but we actually had a, you know, a handful of people that were not excited about what we were doing. Il y a eu un marathon qui a été organisé malgré tout, ça s'appelait le marathon malgré tout, que certains ont couru le dimanche matin, alors que par ailleurs, on, on avait encore sorti des cadavres de la ligne, tout près de la ligne de départ, à deux miles. Il y avait le cadavre d'une mère et de sa fille qui avait été sorti le matin même. The marathon movement, the whole running movement, had to confront the fact that not everybody loves us. That we socially, running had not achieved all that it could achieve. That socially, even though we've grown, even though we're huge, we're actually only huge in a very small segment of society. And we realized that we should not continue to expect that poor people will stand along the streets and cheer for rich people. That came as a surprise to us. In our mind, we were just trying to do like good and trying to run for charity. But there was people afterwards that were like, or during, before we ran, after we made the decision, they were like, you know, why are you doing this? You're just taking resources from the city. You're just trying to get attention to ourselves. And I'm like, you unbelievably don't understand what we're doing. What we're trying to do is finish what we started so we can, like, charity runners are some of the most determined people I've ever met. Like, I, I don't know if I would have ever run a marathon if it wasn't for, like, trying to run for something else. And that was the beginning of your story, too, right? right. Like, you started running for something else. Um, so we actually even had one group, they, they made a Twitter account that was, like, a, a fake Run Anyway marathon account. And they were, like, teasing us along, like, the whole way, saying, like, um, like how we're going to take resources from the city and all this stuff. And they did it in, like, a funny way, but they were still not happy. And I got questions from a lot of people, some friends even, saying, like, well, why are you still doing it? I felt like I wasn't able to give the charity money or take the money from friends and family if I didn't say what I was going to do. So that's what it became for me. Um, and, and when we were starting, we sent out waves of people, it was four big waves. And as people were running, I could see in their faces what kind of runner they were. Like there were some people that were there, they're like, yeah, I'm not going to like let the man tell me I can't run and I'm just going to do it no matter what. And, you know, God bless them. I'm glad that they were there. But the people that were there to run for relatives or run for causes, you could see it in their face. And like as they ran by me, you know, they have their shirt, their names are or the faces on their shirts. A lot of them were they had tears coming down. And I'm like, that's why we're doing this. Yeah, that's why we're doing it. So we can like run for the memories of all these people that we lost. Absolutely. And besides the sixteen thousand um, dollars, I feel like run anyway, uh, the philosophy of run anyway in general, as you came up with the, not just the marathon event, but the, the events that you organized to run anyway afterward. Mm -hmm. um, it's just amazing to me how uh, you can create something that was truly priceless, like a priceless experience that 
I, I joke, but I'm also kind of serious that the fake medal that I got from some <laughs> random person who is not affiliated with Run Anyway in any way, yeah. uh, literally the, the most treasured medal that I have from all of my marathons is this keychain that someone put through a string and just put it around my neck when I finished my Run Anyway marathon. And to me, you can't put a price on that kind of experience. Mm. And I'm sure that everyone else who ran that day feels the same way. And, and even the people who came out just to spectate, to watch their loved ones or people who had traveled across the globe just for this sort of event, um, it was just this uh, magical experience that in a way it's just the entry fee that you pay every year to get into the actual race. That was worth so much more than that, you know? Mm. Then our black was still there. Oh, oh, say does that star spangled banner yet wave or the step back for a moment because if, if those who are watching aren't familiar with your story you're not just this guy who came out of nowhere I mean in a sense you really went into this with about a month of training yep. <laughs> but but just in terms of the life experiences that got you to this moment you know for you to have this opportunity to run the marathon and have the motivation to do it it didn't just come from thin air in your book, which uh, I feel like I need to introduce right now because everyone's got to know about it. <laughs> it's called Run Anyway, of course. Wouldn't call it anything else. <laughs> Run Anyway from the Boston bombing to the mountains of Guatemala. So uh, the Run Anyway New York City Marathon is really just like the first chapter in an amazing odyssey of, exper of running experiences. Mm. Um, but it really all begins with the whole theme of you having such a great close relationship with your family and particularly your Uncle Roy, who you dedicated the marathon and the Boston Marathon to. Tell us a little bit about that, just that background of, of Uncle Roy, that yeah. relationship that you had with him. In the book, I mean, you, you say something that's really amazing, um, just about running for someone other than yourself. And uh, I forget the exact quote, but it's, it's what you said, um, you know, at his eulogy, of what did you say? Can you remind us? Uh, I'll go back to, to the whole sure, family sure, first sure. and then get work up to the eulogy. But um, yeah, so the family that I grew up in, we we were very close. Um, I joke about like I didn't know a lot of like popular music. Like I didn't even I couldn't identify Beatles songs growing up because we didn't listen to music because my family constantly talked to each other, which um, I didn't realize was anything unique until later in life when I went to other people's houses and they didn't get along with their siblings or they constantly complained with their about their parents. I, I was super blessed where uh, my parents raised us that like our siblings are we're supposed to look out for each other you know they used to say this line uh, and still do like who's going to be at your 70th birthday party it's going to be your siblings right which i always thought was so cool because that really changes the, your mentality so i was like am i going to get mad at my older brother kyle for doing something silly when i know that we're going to be you know best friends forever and same with my little sister kara um but we grew up very close, which was very cool. Um, and I have a, a large extended family as well, both on my mom's side, um, but especially on my dad's side too. Um, and the the relative that I've always been closest to um, outside of my immediate family is my Uncle Roy. And um, I always looked up to him. He, him and my dad were 15 years apart. So, um, uh, And my uncle and I are like, I think 20 years apart. So I kind of looked at like he and my dad had the same relationship that he and I have where like um, he taught me a lot of the things um, along with my dad. And I've always looked up to him. He was someone that I wanted to be like, you know, he was this big six, six Norwegian with blonde hair. And when he walked in the room, you knew that Uncle Roy was there. He kind of just like took over with his presence. And and it was always in like a very friendly, outgoing, like, how are you doing type of way? You know, there's people that walk into the room and it's always about them. Like, that's not how um, Uncle Roy was or my dad. Like, it's always about asking questions and how you're doing and finding out what you're and it, it, it's great because it leaves you feeling really good about you 
That's so, really the running spirit, by the way. The runner spirit is like you're out there and you realize this is not a competition about you. It's like yeah. you're a part of a sea of thousands and thousands yeah. of runners and it's about celebrating other people. In a way, Run Anyway is really the whole creation of Run Anyway uh, was in that spirit of just yeah. like this is for the people beside you. So yeah. I think it's actually a really – I have to just point that out. It's such a – a lovely parallel between you, uh, between Uncle Roy's sort of like way of living, of being, and just this whole uh, spirit um, that that you put that into Run Anyway mm. uh, as a philosophy. In um, when we were designing the Run Anyway marathon, in the like day and a half that we had, we were getting messages about like what we can add, and people were like, "Well, can I make T-shirts? Can I do this?" And one person's like, "Can I offer prize money to the winner?" <laughs> And it was the one of the things that I said no to immediately because we weren't running out there for a prize. You know, we were going out there to like finish what we started and everyone was going to be different. Um, so I figured like, you know, we're not going to we're not focusing on the winner. You you win essentially as long as you finish, like just like going out there. So um, one of my dad's mentalities, what he said to me before I took off that day, because um, the Run Anyway Marathon was my first dis you know, 26.2 distance also. He said, you know, I don't care if you're crawling, just finish. Because like, and that's the mentality I had. So that last mile was like excruciatingly painful for me. Like I remember thinking like my feet felt like they were like pools of blood. <laughs> like that's not a fun feeling. And you're not exactly like a seasoned marathoner when you feel that. Um, but my whole mentality was just finish, just finish, just keep going. So like as I'm running, I kept thinking about my dad saying that. I kept thinking about my Uncle Roy who passed away. You know, I kept thinking about the things that were going to keep driving me forward. And, you know, that's really like one of the like main like running mentalities kind of is that like you're focused on not yourself. Because if we went out there to run, you know, we're, we're both running in New York City Marathon this year. If we ran only to win, why even show up? Because right. I mean, you're you know you're very fast. <laughs> I'm not too slow, but we're not gonna we're not gonna compete with the the front runners, right? Of course. Yeah. So we're going out there really to to run for like the enjoyment of it, uh, to finish what we started every year, the training and the raising money and all. So, um, yeah. So that's that's what uh, you know kind of drives us. Um, and uh, in 2012, in January, I got a phone call from Uncle Roy that said they found a, a mass in my brain. And that was like devastating. It really felt like I got punched in the gut. Um, and, you know, he went through surgery. He went through like, you know, stays at the hospital. And we we kept thinking like, well, he's going to come out of it. It's going to be OK. He had one surgery. Everything looked like it was going to be great. And we were, you know, celebrating as a family and praising God. And then it came back. He went through another surgery and we expected the same result. You know, but this one he didn't wake up from. Mm. And that is the moment that was like, it's one of the worst moments of like my life for sure. You know, walking into the hospital, hearing my, my little cousins crying at the time. I'm not super young. They were like, you know, 18, 17 or something at the yeah. time, but they're still my little cousin. So hearing them crying over their dad who they're just being told that he's not going to wake up. Like that's a, you know, hugely devastating moment. And, and we were, you know, praying to God that he would wake up and that wasn't what happened. You know, I was right in his hospital room where he breathed his last. And, you know, there's, I am not sure, there was maybe 30 of us in the room in that last moment. But, um, you know, a couple of days later we had the, the funeral and um, uh, I was among maybe 10 people who gave a eulogy. And um, they were all really great um, eulogies. But when my dad went up there, he retold the story of the greatest athletic feat that he, he's ever done. And it was with Uncle Roy, where in 1983, they ran the New York City Marathon together. And that, as soon as I heard that, you know, I'm sitting in the, in the, the it was a gym because the church couldn't hold everybody because there's over 2,000 people, which was a testimony to Uncle Roy himself. <laughs> but uh, he said, uh, Uncle Roy did it on almost no training. Which is impossible. Like, you can't just run a marathon, right? So he was talking about it, and I'm sitting there thinking, all right, you know, I'm going to do that one day. I'm going to run the New York City Marathon in Uncle Roy's memory, and I'm going to raise money for his family. That was my whole, that was the whole plan. Um, but it, it was April, but then, you know, New York City Marathon's essentially closed. You can't really right. get in. So I was like, all right, well, you know, that's good because it gives me some time to train because I'd never run a marathon before. I, I, I'd, I'd done 5Ks and stuff like that, but that's it. And then I get a call. And it's from who came to be my running mentor. His name's Craig Williams. He's one of the like coolest guys that I know and most determined men that I know. And he said, hey, a spot just opened up on our charity team. Would you run? And I was like, I didn't know. I was like, when is it? And he's like, it's in 30 days. And I was like, yes, right away. And he's like, are you sure? Have you ever done that before? I said, no, but I'll figure it out. 
And he was like, all right, well, there's a you know fundraising component. I was like, don't worry about that. Like, I'll figure that out too. But I just, that day I went out and I just started running. Like I ran until I, you know, blood was in my, th- it felt like blood was in my throat. <laughs> and, you know, when you started running, you, I remember thinking, well, I'm just going to crush this marathon. Right. Like I'm going to, you know, maybe I'll even run with the front pack for a while. That's what I was thinking. Right, right. <laughs> um, and then like mile two hit and I'm like, all oh, that's out the window. I'm just trying to survive. And then I realized what real marathoners go through. It's unbelievable. Like the physical pain. And I didn't have like the physical capabilities to run a marathon. So I'm like, I'm going to have to do this almost all mentally. Oh, you know, just trying to figure out, like, keep pushing my way through. So every day I just ran until I did, like, I couldn't run anymore. That was my training program. Like, I didn't have one <laughs> with 30 days out. Yeah. Um, but I knew that, and it was something I said in the eulogy. I said, it, this was the end of Uncle Roy's life, but it's not going to be the end of his life still affecting people. Right. Yeah. And I was like, how do I do that? And I was like, this is one of the ways, like, the start of how I can do that. Um, so, you know, going out there and training and everything and then getting the news out. Hurricane Sandy is now approaching the east coast of the USA. People of New York City are preparing for the crunch. We have not experienced anything on this scale. We just want everyone to know that we are hurting down here and we need help. Mayor Michael Bloomberg refuses to cancel the marathon. And then the news came that it was canceled, and that's where the Run Anywhere story starts. Wow. And and in case people don't remember how, how quickly that sequence of events happened, I mean, the marathon was canceled on Friday evening. Mm-hmm. We are very angry. We spent thousands of dollars to bring our family here, pay for hotel rooms, airline tickets. We were still inside at the expo, buying tickets to the pasta dinner, buying paraphernalia, spending hundreds of dollars. On a normal year where you're running the marathon, you'd want to be resting as much as possible, but you didn't miss a beat. I mean, you guys, you went to a movie, and by the time you got out of the movie, Run Anyway, which had you just materialized, you know, within a, a few hours, had how many hundreds of people already excited <laughs> messaging right. you saying like, so when does it start? What what do we do? What you know? Yeah. Bon, ben finalement c'est assez simple. Une petite invitation sur Facebook et puis voilà, on se retrouve à 10 000 à faire un footing à Central Park. Just the fact that that all happened so quickly during that time of the internet in 2012, it's very different from the way it is now. Nowadays, we think, oh, it's super easy to just reach out to tons and tons of people. That's right. But yeah, back but then, even it a took a lot more ago. work. Yeah. yeah, it really did. And um, I, I knew I wanted to run anyway. So we were actually in Staten Island giving out food to um, those really hard hit areas when the news came in that it was canceled. And I got like eight text messages immediately that all said, sorry, man, it's canceled. And they was like, that stunk, of course. But I went home and we were going to plan, we were planning to see a movie later, but I was like, there must be people that are going to just do it anyway. Or people like me that wanted to. So I searched for, I don't know, like 20 minutes, which is a long time in the search world <laughs> uh, about like, Hey, there must be groups out there that are doing it. I couldn't find any. And I was like, all right, well, I'll start one. Like, let's see if people might want to join it. And I, it was like the most insecure I've ever felt like creating this group. Cause I was like, Oh, no one's going to do this. It's going to be silly. But I started it and I shared it in a couple groups and on my own Facebook wall. And then we went to the movies. And then when we got back from the movies, all of a sudden there was like 60 people in it. And I was like, Oh, Oh, this is good. And then by the time I went to bed, we were getting messages saying like, you know, I, I've already flown here from Australia. You know, me and my 20 of my mates, you know, we're going to be there with you. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, like all of a sudden this is going to be like a real thing. And then when we woke up the next morning, we in the, the inbox, we had like news reporters asking about this thing that we started. Um, like what time, where are we going to be, like what to bring, how else can we help? So that was really cool. So that whole day was like the most wired I've ever been. So, I, you know, I told my roommate about it, what, you know, what's going on, of course. So he jumped on and started answering questions. My sister, who is like good at everything, she got involved and she started answering messages. She got, uh, she went out and got a banner made. We got t-shirts made. She had stickers. It was like all the stuff that she did really quickly. I also called my friend and said, hey, can you make us a logo really quickly? <laughs> and so she, she made us a logo. It's the one that we used. And it all happened so fast. But that was like the joy of it. It was so fun. Yeah. The, the next day we woke up. Um, and started making our way to Central Park. And of course my parents knew about it, so they were on their way in. And my mom said this line that I love. She said, there was all these people here, and she was like, I hope all these people don't mess up uh, Lance's race. And 
then they realize like, oh, all these people are here to do like to to run anyway. Like how amazing. So and you were one of those people, which was so cool. Yeah, I came later in the after in in the mid afternoon, mm. uh, which was actually kind of late, and I finished sort of just before sundown. Um, because I had really only heard that this was going on. I heard an echo of it the night before. Someone had mentioned that there was some group that was going to do some laps in the yep, park the next right. day. <laughs> and awesome. I wake up and, uh, you know, I just feel like, what the heck? Let's just go to Central Park. I'll wear my running shoes, whatever. Yeah. And uh, I'm there and I'm just blown away. It's, uh, it's unlike anything I ever imagined. And I had never run an official race at that point. So I had no idea what the race is normally right. like. But I imagined it was something like this. And I thought, well, this is just too special to pass up. Mm. And, um, you know, I went out there and I was running. And, and what was amazing was, now looking back on it, the people were cheering as if every 10 feet you were about to cross the finish line. <laughs> because people had no idea how They didn't how know far... where your finish was. Exactly right. right. <laughs> um, so it was just this unbelievable electric uh, event mm. that was going on. And, you know, I was training for Team IBD Kids, which was a charity run out of Mount Sinai Hospital. And the team captain was my gastroenterologist, Dr. Benkov, and he's been running the marathon for many, many years. He's been on this show. And during my first loop, as I'm going up Harlem Hill, I see him in the distance and I kind of catch up to him on the hill. And it was this really like beautiful two minutes where we're running together. And looking back on it, that would never have happened if mm. not for you and your roommate and your sister's efforts. It was just really, really amazing. And the fact that you worked tirelessly throughout that weekend, showed up, gave all those interviews, and then you still ran your own marathon <laughs> on a really hilly course on one month of training, you know, that's like Uncle Roy's strength just, you know, mm. channeling straight through you, uh, following in his footsteps and in the same way, you know, he kind of ran without any training either. So I just think that whole chapter is just, uh, you know, in, in any runner's lifetime, one story like that is amazing. You've mm. got a whole book of them. It's amazing. What, at what point did you decide, I have to write a book, like about all of these things that you've done? Yeah. Um, well, really good question that I'm going to get to. Sure. Um, but <laughs> you, you said that somebody gave you like a, a makeshift medal. Yeah. It was just like a keychain, and you, yeah. you actually have it like displayed, and you said it was one it's of the- It's like, in my mom's apartment. I've got uh, an old tro a participation trophy that I got from, <laughs> from playing tennis in middle school once. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't win any match when I was playing tennis in middle school, but I have this big trophy to show for yeah. it. And uh, I used to hang all of my race medals around this trophy in my mom's apartment where I used to live. And uh, that was the very first one oh, that I got cool. to put around that trophy. Yeah. It was a keychain wrapped, you know, with a string. Yeah. And well, it's, yeah. But I did bring you something. No. Um, I thought you would like uh, an official, unofficial oh my God. finisher's medal. Oh, my God. Of Run Anyway. These are the wow. medals that we had made up afterwards. Wow. That is your oh official. Oh, my God. I'll just tell you, the keychain, as nice as the keychain <laughs> is, folks, this is now the most prized medal that yes. I have in my collection. <laughs> thank oh, you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, oh, you're very welcome. This really means a lot to me. Good. So thank well, you. I'm very glad. So putting it on. Yo, know, go ahead. <laughs> so you, you asked about the um, the book and how it, it came to be. One of the things I, I do um, try to do as often as I can is I, I do like to journal, and it, it helps me like uh, with my relationship with God and helps me like get my thoughts out. And so I, I like to journal. So that was really nice that I actually was journaling during these big events. So you know after running anyway marathon. You know, that week I was journaling and after the Boston Marathon, you know, I was journaling and uh, writing down these events. So that was really helpful. And then um, you mentioned earlier, but I'm in uh, in ministry and I'm a youth pastor now up in uh, in Connecticut. Uh, before I was in Summit, New Jersey, and every week I would get up in front of the students uh, or almost every week and I would give a, a message of what's going on. So here at Kids Camp and at Walnut Hill, we are really excited about the Bible. We like reading the Bible and talking about the Bible stories and everything. And you always try to tie the, the Bible, what we're reading, but with also like current events and stuff like that. So I had all of those messages and I have them all saved. And then I had my interviews. So all of a sudden I started like looking at my journal and the interviews and the messages and I started putting them together. And I'm like, I think I got something. And it was really exciting because I was thinking, well, you know, it's interesting to me and it's interesting <laughs> to like, my family and stuff, but like, is it going to be interesting to other people? So um, I started, you know, putting it in, weaving stuff in. And then I realized that like, I started going into the beginning of where it would start, and it's really with <clears throat> my family and my relationship with Uncle Roy and my relationship with God. And then I was looking for like a, a nice wrap-up ending, um, and that really came towards the end with us going into the mountains of Guatemala. 
So all of a sudden I realized that I had the bookends and I'm like, I think I have something. So I put it together. I started presenting it to um, a couple editors and publisher and they liked what I was doing. So I was like, this is fantastic. So um, that's kind of where the idea of the book came from that me just hoping that I had something showing it to people and they say, I think you got something. So continue the working on it. Um, and it was nice because it just got published at the end of February, but working on it was like six years, you know, like I wish I could say like, oh, I just, you know, threw it together, but it was a lot of the writing it and then editing, editing was the big part. Yeah. I mean, it's years of life work too. Yeah. It's just like living through it was the work of it. It's such a fun read. I really hope that people pick up the book because I think that what you said before, of just like you weren't sure that other people would be able to get something out of it the same way that you know, you you like it, and obviously it resonates with your family because they also lived through it in a way through you. Um, I mean, I I loved this book, and it really, really, really resonated with me. I recently recently became a certified coach, and with uh, the runners who I've been connecting with as a coach, I've really been trying to get people to understand this feeling of like you're a runner when you decide to run, like mm -hmm. when you decide you're a runner. That's the only qualification that really matters. And you say that right in the beginning of this book. And, you know, without, without spoiling too much of the book, because it, it is really just like uh, awe-inspiring reading a lot of these stories. Oh, thank you. Um, this book, it, to me, it's really accessible to everybody, whether or not you run. It's just finding the joy um, and the meaning in anything that you feel compelled to do and just following down that road and right. seeing where it leads you and also just embracing the opportunities and seeing challenges as opportunities and just seeing where that takes you down the, down the road. This is a, such a great example of that. And um, you know, it makes me just more excited than I was before to run this year's marathon, yeah. to just, to also just look for other things to do that were really cool. I mean, some of these, some like the relay that you guys do every year over Memorial Day weekend, it's 500 for the Fallen. Yep. And it's this amazing, epic relay that you put together uh, in honor of gold star families like i want to do something like that you know right. that that gets me so excited and normally my my running events have been pretty limited to just doing a race and trying to do my best time um but this is the kind of book that i think is going to get anybody whether they're even not in, into athletics whether they're into drawing painting whatever mm. um just you know seeing where it takes them in life because uh i i think you know Correct me if I'm wrong, but you probably never saw yourself going down this road up right. until probably, you know, that within that one year span of 2012, just life radically, uh, radically changed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, like, like the, the opportunities that came up were really cool. And um, I noticed that the more like excited I was, like the more it kind of drawed other people's attention and it was you know, give opening up other opportunities. So like how I got into Boston marathon, I didn't qualify for the time. Like you have, you know, I, I can't do that right now. <laughs> Me neither. I, I couldn't do it then. <laughs> um, I certainly couldn't do it after just New York. Um, but I got in because the run anyway, marathon got a whole bunch of attention and, um, that got us into the Boston Marathon. And, you know, 2013 was the big year of the, the Boston bombing where I happened to, I finished uh, 10 minutes before the bombing and I saw, we were looking at the finish line when the, the bombs went off. Um, so it was like how these things just kept, you know, one thing led to another, led to another. And it was just like me not knowing where this was going, but just having the faith that like this was leading somewhere where it was like supposed to go. So my mentality is like to, to keep pursuing something until God makes it very obviously that you're not supposed to. Um, and that that's been, been really good. And, and just the fact that like, I, I have the trait that a lot of runners have, which is just like enthusiasm. Like yeah. we just get excited <laughs> over things. And, and all of a sudden when we, when I realized that I could tie into helping people, like that got me even more exciting. So like being able to raise money for gold star families, that was like a huge honor being able to do that, you know, cause I have never served, but I like unbelievably admire people that have, you know, and, and I figured like, this is one way that I could help families that like have lost so much. Like I don't understand what they went through exactly, but I understand loss. Yep. You know, having lost people that I love and, um, you know, being able to remember them in a special way like that, that's really cool. And being able to just do like something like that has been has been great. Like you said, it's not just for for runners, right? Like I had a, a bunch of people that have never run marathons or have never run before, but they said it like inspires them to do what they're going after. And I'm like, oh, that's that's fantastic, because right. if you're pursuing something that you love or, you know, you have a, a big interest in, if this gets you doing that, that's I mean, that feels like a huge win. So. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and the other the other thing is so great about it is just like, you know, we think about um, running as a sort of um, as a, a channel for mm. people to 
focus on things to overcome adversity yeah. in their lives, you know, and, and you know, I, I think of the um, 500 for the Fallen as being sort of a great, even though you said you've never served, it's a great service for those people yeah. who are the family members of those who serve to have a special occasion, to have something to memorialize them by, to, 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 uh, to be able to honor them with something that's just so symbolic and memorable um, and meaningful to them. Um, giving people those opportunities is, in a way, is a service that mm. uh, is so important. And again, it, you know, I could say this all day, but uh, Run Anywhere New York City Marathon was the same thing. And I think that, um, you know, in a way, just the event of the 2014 Boston Marathon, which you also ran with your roommate, for him to be able to say he also completed it. Yeah. Because he was stopped after the explosions went off, he was stopped before the finish line. The idea of continuing to push on and to persist and to provide these sort of events for people who need something to something to go toward, you know, something yeah. to train towards, something to motivate them. Um, you know, in a way, that's a, that's a beautiful thing that you guys are doing. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, like going after that goal, going yeah. after that thing that that means a lot to you. Like you said, even uh, uh, my roommate Todd, who he didn't finish the, the Boston Marathon the year of the bombing in 2013, he was stopped at the bridge. There's that iconic photo of the runners being stopped by that one of the last bridges. He wasn't himself, the, you know, the, the next day because he's like, I just have this feeling like I haven't finished. Like I got to I got to right. finish. So we we set up a, a makeshift finish line for him. You know, the, the next morning, I you know, we ran out and how much more he needed to run. And it was just me and him on the side street. But he got to finish, you know, and all of a sudden he said it felt like closure which was really cool. And then it was a real gift that we got to go back in 2014 to do the whole, the whole marathon again. One of the, the things that you mentioned before, like, you know, as you're running, you kind of like get to work things out and you get to think through things. Yeah. Um, what I, uh, for the New York City Marathon, I'm actually the uh, the chaplain for the New York City Marathon. Yeah, uh, and I had no idea this was a thing, by the way, until yeah. until I read this in the book that every year at the at the Star Village, so that you you do that every morning before the marathon begins. Yes, like that's a whole thing also that you gotta mentally be in the zone to yeah. do to because. People need to hear these words to really empower them and get them ready to go. Yeah, so uh, uh, Marathon Chapel started in uh, 1985, the year I was born, which is cool. And uh, a great man named Donald Payne started it. I started speaking there in 2013. So in 2013, I helped speak at the chapel service, which went really great. And in it, I talked about like, it, there's a lot of running is about taking the focus off of yourself. Like for me, like my legs get in a lot of pain when I'm running, not surprisingly. But I noticed that if I take the focus off myself and put right. it on something else, and for me, it's through prayer. And if I start praying for like the guy in front of me who clearly is hurting or like someone else that I see needs it, or I start thinking about friends and family who need prayer and I start praying for that, um, I notice that the pain seems way less in, in my current position. So it's a lot about like, you know, trying to focus on, on other things, which I think running really, really helps with. So I spoke at the, the chapel service two years and then uh, Donald Payne uh, and I connected and he's like, you know, I've been thinking about, you know, a younger guy coming to, to take over this and why don't we run it to, or organize it together for a couple of years and then we can pass it off. So that moment's coming up, but uh, it's been really cool. So this year I'm, I'm expecting you there. Now I know where to find you. That's right, where the, <laughs> the marathon uh, village starts. So uh, for anyone who is running the marathon, please join us. It's a great time. We, we do three back-to-back -back services. They're all pretty short. Um, but we, we do communion and prayer and a, and a, and a message and, and like, and the message is really just an encouragement. So it's a non non-denominational worship service. So no matter what your, your faith or your religion is, you know, come and we'll just, uh, you know, hopefully encourage and, uh, spend some time together. And it's inside a tent, right? It's inside so of a guys, very warm tent. Uh... <laughs> we got bagels. We got, yeah. So, uh, it, but it's very enjoyable. It's a time where a lot of runners will come every year where you get to reconnect. So cool. for some, it's the only time I see them all year, but it's a, it's a really great time. That's really really cool well yeah. thank you for sharing that that's uh i'll definitely keep an eye out for that's you it. Yeah. you know i'm gonna be there so uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, i know where to find you um that's that's really awesome um one other chapter in the book that you you briefly mentioned a moment ago was your travels to guatemala mm. and you know again this sort of connects back to being youth pastor with your ministry um i guess tell me about that experience of just uh for for those who are not familiar who haven't read the book um what was it like being down there and uh you know, during this time, you know, this, this is a whole different world. 
and helping a lot of people who are in need in a very different way, you know, yeah. from, from what you had previously experienced before. Yeah. So being in ministry and especially in youth ministry, you know, we typically will take our youth to missions trips. And um, I was very fortunate to get hooked up with an organization called Hope of Life. And they're in Guatemala. And um, I met this, the guy who runs his name is Carlos Vargas and a fantastic individual. Thanks to our partner in ministry, Carlos Vargas, many of these severely malnourished children are rescued through the good work of Hope of Life. Carlos says in his mentality is instead of going and building a church right away, he would go into a village and make sure that they have like a clean water source. And then he would go and make sure that they have consistent food. And then he'd start working on the shelters. And then when they have those basic needs filled, you know what he does? He goes in and he builds a church. Because he had this mentality of, you know, people are much more likely to start thinking about other things when their basic needs are met. And I heard that right away and I was like, man, this is something that I could get excited about because it's, it's certainly different and it, it's very, very practical. So they, he says that they, they do a practical ministry, practical gospel, which I really, really love. With that, one of the things that they do is called a, a baby rescue. So they're up in the mountains of Guatemala in a place called Zacapa. That the only way you can get through is by foot. That's the only way. You can't take a jeep. You can't do any. Can't even ride a bike because the paths are so right. narrow. Very precarious hiking. Yes, very <laughs> by much foot so. is one way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> and so they have this guy. Uh, his name is Alfredo, and he's one of my life's heroes. And Alfredo has a satellite phone. He's this really small Guatemalan man, and he goes from mountain village to mountain village, like mountain peak to mountain peak, see how the people are doing and if there's any really sick children. And when he does, he has a satellite phone that he calls in and he says, yes, we have a, you know, a near death child in this village. Like someone has to come get him. And then Hope of Life organizes a team and sends them up into the mountains. And back when I started going there, they typically sent Guatemalans, people that were used to the altitude, used to going on these really thin trails and stuff like that. And they didn't let a lot of Americans go up into like the, the, the top of the mountain. They would have us in, like, in the bottom and like receive the children. I can spend the time up in the mountains at altitude because I ran in, in at Bear Mountain in New York. I was like, I know I can do this. Would you send me? And um, they felt comfortable enough that uh, I, with my like credentials that they sent me up into like the actual mountains this time. And it was so cool. We got to go up and we went into these really remote villages and find these kids that were very, very sick. Um, and the whole goal is to get them, bring them down to the hospital and get them medical care like as fast as possible. And so that first trip I got to go on, we went into this, this one village and we found this little girl named Norfa. And she was eight years old, but in the book I described, she looks more like she was three. Um, all except that her, her stomach was distended because her liver was failing. And it was like there was a beach ball under her, her mm. little dress. So we ended up getting her down and, um, and we found, we got word, they said that, you know, she, she was getting the medical attention she needs. And if we didn't, if nobody got to her, she would probably have been dead within two or three days. And that was a real big shock. And my Americanness really felt like, you know, I was a real hero. Like I went up there and I did this and I kind of had to check myself because in my journaling, I was reading back, I'm writing about it and saying like, you know, it was really great that I got to do this opportunity. But if, if Hope of Life didn't send me, they would have just sent the next guy who was willing to go. So it was cool that, uh, that they allowed me to be the person to go up. Um, but it wasn't like me who did it. You know, it was this organization that I just got plugged into that allowed me to right. go up and be that guy. To be fair, though, there is only one Lance. If I had to be rescued from a mountain in Guatemala, <laughs> you know, if I had to choose my rescuer, I, I wouldn't just say, oh, just anybody. Like, you know, I would, I would imagine that's a pretty fortunate position to be in. <laughs> oh, you know? thing. those stories are in the book. And I realized that, like, I probably wouldn't have had strong enough legs to go up there if I wasn't training for the marathon. I certainly wouldn't have been used to altitude, you know. Um, but since I had done these things, it at least impressed the guy enough that he trusted me to go up there. And now they actually send Americans up almost all the time, which is great. This organization, Hope of Life, is one that I've like fallen in love with. I've been there, uh, I think, six times. It stinks last year and this current year. We're not going to be able to go because of the pandemic. But uh, we're looking at 2022 being able to go and bringing uh, you know, a bunch of the you know, kids from the church and you know, volunteers to go back into these mountains and help out Hope of Life and Alfredo, whose nickname is The Runner. 
which how cool is that? Like Alfredo the runner, that's what they call him. So it's I had meant like, to be. Yeah, I love that right <laughs> away. So when I was journaling about that, that's when I realized like I think this is enough to put it together and hopefully it's like an interesting enough read. Well, it absolutely is. No, yes, yeah. yeah, and I and I look forward to the sequel. By the way, I'm sure there's going to be. <laughs> it's got to be. This is not the end of the story. It's amazing, actually. It's a great point about journaling. It's so important. Um, you know, there was a time in my life where I journaled for a hundred days straight. Oh, nice. And I am so happy that I preserved that in a book. And that one book just has so many memories. And occasionally, I'll open it up and I'll look at some pages and I'll read through day 63 of whatever. Yeah. And, uh, you know what I think uh, is so cool? Yeah. Is later in life, how cool would it be like if your children picked up that book? A absolutely. And they got exactly. to read, like, this is what my dad was doing. So, one of the motivations to actually finish the book is that since the book, I've gotten married and had children. And I'm thinking, like, what if one of my children is seven months old? Like, how cool would it be like one day he's going to read this and think, like, that was my dad? Yeah. You know, I, that's what I think is really cool. That's awesome. Yeah, no, that's exactly the way I think about it. Is this is going to be uh, like a family artifact, yes. you know? <laughs> a certain number of generations will go by and no one knows who the heck I am or what this was. And the, but the, at least the your pencil kids, on the pages right? are probably, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. That's what's meaningful. Um, and so, you know, there are details that I'll remember reading it that, uh, that I didn't remember until right. I look back on it. So it's really, really cool. Um, it, you know, when it comes to the pandemic, which you just mentioned, obviously, you know, this is something that has been going on since uh, you published the book. Yeah. And, you know, in a way, with all these virtual races that have uh, gone on, it's become sort of a standard thing now over the last couple of years. Um, Run Anyway, in a sense, was like a pioneer of that. You know, it's like, OK, well, all these races are canceled, so run we can anyway. run anyway, yeah. any, you know, right? <laughs> and it was cool because it, in a way, it really democratized uh, running to you don't just have to run on a sanctioned course to feel like you actually achieved the challenge of running a marathon or yeah. whatever distance you're doing it now it's virtual 5k's miles whatever what do you think about everything that happened with the pandemic um you know in terms of through through the lens of your life experiences and and run anyway and yeah. maybe uh you know you feel like you deserve a little bit of credit for uh <laughs> the trend yeah oh certainly no no i no i actually don't but when they were coming to do like virtual races and like do your own course races. And I'm like, oh, I've, we, that's what we, we did. We, you know, that's where we, we started. And so it was cool watching those things happen because people would say like, how cool is it that we're doing this? And what a great idea. And I'm like, we've already done that. That's, that's great. <laughs> so but 2012. So 2012. That's 2012. You know. <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's this feeling of like pushing through. And, you know, when every, with everything going on with the pandemic, of course, it changed because now there's like health health uh, issues involved and, you know, the social distancing and stuff like that. But, I, you know, I was even hoping like when the, the pandemic first started, I don't know about you, but like we noticed a lot of people around our neighborhoods, like they were getting out and they were running more and they were exercising more. And I'm like, I don't know exactly what the virus is, but I bet exercise helps like people feel better, you know, or it makes them more healthy to less likely catch it or whatever it was with uh, wanting to finish the book uh, while you know, like people were still in the pandemic. Cause I'm like, maybe we'll, more people would read it because they're staying right. at home or more, more, you'll get more people running right. um, and stuff like that. Your story is one where you dealt with tragedy and a silver lining of that was it, it allowed you to go down this road that you may have gone down anyway, but you took uh, in the face of tragedy, you, you found some inspiration, some something to live for, you mm -hmm. know, in order to to really make your words uh, come to fruition of if this wasn't the end of Uncle Roy affecting people's lives. And uh, so many people were hurt in so many ways by the pandemic, mm -hmm. hurt or affected, um, you know, whether it was they lost their job and they had to start a whole new direction in life or they lost a loved one or they got sick themselves. I know some runners in the community uh, who yeah. used to run with me at, at, in group runs uh, who are still recovering from COVID after over a year. Um, in a way, this is giving people um, more opportunities to run for something other than themselves. Yeah. Uh, something bigger than themselves, bigger than just running for the medal. You know, every, yeah. every year you run and you get a medal. But in a way, these virtual marathons took on a whole new meaning for people. Um, and I think that that was just that was the first thing that I thought about as I was mm. reading your book. And I was kind of wondering if there'd be a chapter at the end about this, but it's still so current. You know, I'm yeah. sure you're still processing everything that's yeah. going on. Yeah. Well, processing is definitely true, because with the pandemic, I think it allowed a lot of people to spend time reflecting. 
a lot of time spending like thinking about life, especially with the, the amount of like worldwide deaths. And then it got even closer to home. And we all know people who either lost someone or lost somebody that we know um, due to COVID. I lost a, an aunt. Mm -hmm. And it, um, it, it really makes you, you think about life and like think about your relationships and what really matters. And, you know, it almost sounds cliche, but like there's some things in life that really matter and some things that really don't. You know, and like when the whole world stops, all of a sudden you, it gives you some time to think more about yourself, which, or think about other people, which I think running really does also. It's like a time that you've designated that like you can get to reflect and work out things. And um, so that's always been one of the, the gifts of running. Absolutely. During parts of the pandemic, I was working at my local running store and so many people came in saying, I'm looking for my first pair of running shoes. So oh, I want to so cool. get into running. You know, I want to sign up for this thing because I need some outdoor time. Yeah, uh, they were stuck inside and they just needed something to run for. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they again, it didn't matter that there was any official thing to do. I knew a lot of people who just ran a distance and that they called it a day and they yeah. were really happy with and that. they were happy. Yeah. So, you know, run anyway has so many meanings that uh, just to me, it's it took on a whole new meaning over the last couple of years. Oh, thank you. And so <laughs> so now we're coming out of the pandemic. I mean, what's what's next for you? What's next for run anyway? Um, give me a preview of the future, if yeah. you can see into a crystal ball. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Well, I'm in, I'm in Connecticut now, so right. uh, that's been really good. I started working at a, a church up there uh, just a, a few months ago, um, actually the same month that the book came out. So things have been really exciting there and um, certainly exciting with uh, the book release. So um, promoting the book as much as possible. So getting to, to speak at a couple different schools uh, coming up, which is always fun. I, I really enjoy speaking to, to middle schoolers and high schoolers. So that those are always cool. I also entered into many book contests, which I'm hoping, who knows, just to get some recognition or um, who knows what comes out of it. But it's been fun um, hearing people's reviews of the book because I'm, I'm like hoping it's not just because like, <laughs> I know them, but I'm getting, now I'm starting to get messages from people I don't know saying that they've gotten a lot out of the book. And, um, but anyone who knows me or has heard me speak on like an interview or a video, they say that one of the cool things about reading the book is that they can almost hear my voice in it. Yeah, It's cool they say it's a very conversational book so they can like hear yeah. Um, or very relatable book, which yeah, has been it's cool. Yeah, it's a very, yeah, no, it's a very easy read. Uh, you know, it's it's written in a very fun no, voice. Good. It just makes it fun to read. And also there's a self real, there's a sort of a, a self-awareness to the book too. That it's not, you know, it's not super serious all the time, this right. running stuff. It's not, uh, you know, what people don't realize is that a lot of us runners, you know, we're not really like, com you know, super competitive people. We, you know, self-deprecate all the yeah. time and like there's oh, a lot gosh. of that in the book it's a lot of griping but, but it's a lot of it's all in good spirit you know yeah. it's it's all in good fun and uh and especially with the book i'm taking some pretty hard topics right like hurricane absolutely. sandy absolutely the boston yeah. bombing children dying in the mountains of guatemala and doing the best i can to like like bring some levity to it so it's also like a joy where you want to keep reading right um so I tried very hard to do, to do that, and I think it came through, which is good. Yeah, and so. it's, it sends a message also just having having a sense of levity in life allows you to be able to do the hard work that will help other people on their journeys, mm. you know, and, and it'll help you get through the journey itself, no matter how challenging it is. I think that's a super important message in the book. That's not necessarily something that you've written on a page. It's something that is just uh, living and breathing throughout the, the whole book itself, so... Yeah. Oh, great. Well, Bam. thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. So I'm hoping more and more people read it, of course, so to potentially inspire them to go after what they really want. And and obviously I'm coming at it also with a, a youth pastor or a ministry um, kind of overall. So I do talk about that and I talk about prayer um, and that has been something that's meant a, a whole lot to me. So if, it, if this helps other people do that as well, like do some inward reflection, like I feel like that's also um, a big deal and, and kind of like a, a win, as I would say. So, um, but uh, yeah, it's been, it's been really good. I'm looking forward to the fall and see what that's like and then getting the book out there more and more. Awesome. Well, Lance, until then, it's been a pleasure having you. It's been, uh, it's been great you know, sitting down and talking and, and reminiscing about these great memories that yeah. we shared apart. That's right. Um, and I, I can't wait to see what's next. Yeah, I'm um, looking forward to our paths keeps crossing. This is, it's gonna be good. Absolutely, so. I'll, I'll see you in November. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Maybe. <Yeah>. So <laughs> thank you, Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And thank you, Will Sanchez, for having us. Gotta run. <laughs> Bye, guys.